It's hard to talk about Latin America, I, I will admit freely, uh, when you follow uh, speakers or you listen to speakers, as you often do, who talk about nuclear war. Um, because a lot of people don't, don't associate Latin America with a, uh, a threat to the United States. But let's not forget that the closest this country ever came to nuclear war was in 1962, uh, because of a, uh, a communist regime in this hemisphere, the United States had uh, underestimated uh, Cuba and that had allowed its territory to be used by the Soviets to base nuclear weapons whose purpose it was to hold the United States hostage if necessary or perhaps to fire them. Wh whether they ever intended to, we may never know. Uh, but we do know that Fidel Castro begged Nikita Khrushchev to do just that at the height of the missile crisis. And interestingly, last week, the New York Times, uh, not exactly a conservative newspaper, reported that that was not the only time that Fidel Castro urged a Soviet leader to fire missiles at the United States. But he did it again in the early 80s when some of us here were already in government uh, in the Reagan administration. So let's not underestimate this hemisphere, uh, because if we do, we do so at our peril. And what I'd like to tell you today is that we, again, face real threats from this hemisphere, as we have practically every decade. I mentioned the missile crisis in the 60s, and there were other uh, you know, famous incidents of the Cold War, the, the, the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the, the decade of the 70s was uh, full of uh, terrorism, urban terrorism. Uh, most Americans didn't even know the concept of terrorism, uh, but, the, but the Latin Americans are very familiar with it. Practically every capital city in this hemisphere was the object of terrorism uh, that was funded by Castro, by the way, and the terrorists were trained in training camps in Cuba. Cuba was was a, a gulag of training camps for terrorists from every major terrorist group in the hemisphere. I don't have time to list uh, all of them. In the 80s, uh, I hope everybody here is old enough to remember the involvement of the United States in the region uh, and the fact that had it not been for President Reagan, I think the outcome would have been very, very different in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Grenada, uh, in Panama, actually, Panama was the, the Bush 41 administration that took a step to remove an anti-American leader uh, who was building a narco state in that country. Now, there's another anti-American leader who's building a narco state in his country today, and that's Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched him on Larry King last night. Uh, I, I watched part of it. I wasn't able to watch all of it. And, and he was true to form, lying lying absolutely through his teeth about what he's doing in Venezuela. What's he doing and why does it affect us? Uh, what Hugo Chavez has done in the 10 years he's been in power in Venezuela, uh, and by the way, he won an election democratically, and I hope perhaps we have time later on to talk about how some of these leaders of the, the alliance created by Castro and Chavez called ALBA, which very few people know about, but it's an alliance of, of nine countries now in the region, how they get to power democratically, then change the rules to, so they can stay in power forever, which is what President Celaya was trying to do in Honduras when he was caught. Uh, and now the administration, the government of the United States is trying to put Hugo Chavez's ally, Celaya, back in office against the will of every single institution of government in Honduras. I hope we have time to talk about that. What's Chavez doing? In the 10 years that he has presided over Venezuela, Venezuela has become one of the most heavily armed countries in the history of this continent. Chavez just came back from like the fifth or sixth trip um, that he's taken to Russia. He has either purchased or received lines of credit from Russia in the last 10 years of several billion dollars minimum of five, possibly $10 billion for everything you can think of, T-72 tanks, uh, surface-to-air missiles, an AK-47 factory. He didn't just go and buy 100,000 AK-47s. This was several years ago, not on the first trip. 
uh, 100,000, well, I was ambassador to Venezuela, and, the, and I know how many people were in the Venezuelan armed forces at the time, it was 65,000. Uh, there weren't, that, there are not that many more now. In fact, Chavez has really demoralized the Venezuelan military as he has built up a militia that he says is going to number a million. Some people say two million. So this AK-47 factory is, is certainly uh, has the capacity to uh, uh, arm every one of those million if necessary, but in the meantime, what has happened to the weapons that the Venezuelan military had prior to the AK-47 uh, coming into their hands? They used to use uh, Belgian uh, FAL rifles, FALs, uh, and they're probably being exported to other groups uh, in, the, in the hemisphere, uh, some of Chavez's allies. He, so he's not only built a, a huge military, and I can go into some of the, the, the actual weapon systems. Uh, he has built relationships with terrorist groups, and they have been documented. A year and a half ago, Colombian Special Forces raided a camp, uh, a FARC camp. I'm sure everybody's heard about the, the Colombian Armed Forces, uh, Revolutionary Armed Forces, or FARC in Spanish, uh, in that this camp was inside Ecuador. It was a permanent camp. It was a command and control and training operation where they received foreign visitors. And of course, the Ecuadorian government says, gee, they didn't know about it. Uh, uh, it, it, the documents captured, actually laptops captured by the Colombian forces have been validated by Interpol. They said, yes, they, are, they, they were examined, that they were legitimate. And they clearly showed a, a long history of economic, diplomatic, political, logistical, uh, and other support by Chavez to the FARC. Um, that was just one of the groups. Uh, there was a, one, uh, more than one citation there about providing $300 million to the FARC for their use and for other guerrilla groups, Marxist groups in Central America and South America. Uh, Chavez has created this alliance with radical leaders in, in the hemisphere, including people that, you know, sort of a blast from the past like Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, who is back. Uh, new people like Evo Morales, uh, a coca grower. It's, he was the, actually the, 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 the president of the Coca Growers Union in a particular part of Bolivia. He's now the president of Bolivia, and he is somebody who has said that he would like to take his country back to the pre Columbian times because that's when his particular ethnic group, he belongs to one of the three major ethnic um, indigenous populations in Colombia, that's when they were at their uh, best before Columbus arrived. Um, I mean, so, so some of them are colorful, but they're all dangerous. Uh, the president of Ecuador, the, the opposite of Evo Morales and his pre-Columbian uh, dreams, president of Ecuador, uh, Rafael Correa, is a graduate of the University of Illinois, uh, one of the University of Illinois uh, campuses, it has a, a, a doctorate in economics. And he's, for me, just as dangerous as Chavez uh, or Correa, except he has, doesn't have Chavez's money. Money is a key factor here. The first country that Fidel Castro visited after he came to power in Cuba was Venezuela. Four weeks, just four weeks, in January of 1959, after Castro came in, he went to visit Venezuela, uh, and he asked the president of Venezuela at the time, who was a Democrat, left the center Democrat, Romulo Betancourt, who later became quite very anti-communist, as, in my opinion, most left the center intelligent people have to become, uh, eventually. As Churchill said, if you're, not a, if you're not a liberal when you're 20, you don't have a heart. If you're still a liberal when you're 40, you don't have a brain. Uh, when, or if you're not a conservative, whatever. Uh, Castro asked, uh, President Betancourt for $300 million, which at that time, it would be about $3 billion today, uh, 50 years later. And Betancourt said, why, why do you need $300 million? Cuba is a rich country, and it was. Cuba was one of the three richest countries in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, Castro says, because I need it to do what I need to do to the Yankees. To, that's us. Uh, not, not the baseball team, but the country, the United States. Uh, that was his plan. And Incredibly, 40 years later, in 1999, uh, Hugo Chavez comes in, actually was elected in December of 98, 
and inaugurated in January of 99, and Chavez has used enormous quantities of Venezuelan money, uh, unprecedented. The money has come into Venezuela in the last 10 years. It's more than that came into Venezuela in the previous 100 years because of the, 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 the jump in the price of oil. I mean, we've never seen oil at, even at, at today's relatively low prices of 70, that's one half of what it was last year, the, 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 uh, the amount of money coming in is enormous. The amount of corruption in Venezuela is enormous. And that combination of this anti-American ideology, the aggressiveness, the, military, the militarization of Venezuela, the corruption, um, and one thing that I haven't talked about, the drugs, narcotics, along with the support for the FARC, Chavez has become involved in the narcotics business. The FARC controls 60% of the narcotics that come out of Colombia. They, they, this is how they've been remained in business for the last 15, 20 years. They were at one point a ideological, a Marxist guerrilla operation, but they, along with some freelance paramilitaries on the other side of the spectrum, who are mostly just freelance uh, thugs, uh, and who have now been eliminated by President Uribe of Colombia, the, the, the paramilitaries, 30,000 of them have surrendered in the, in the seven years of Uribe. But along with, with the, the extreme left and, and the paramilitaries, they controlled the drug trafficking. Now that the paramilitaries have, been, uh, have surrendered, uh, the the non-ideological, ideological, non-military traffickers only have 40 percent. The FARC has 60 percent. Three very high-ranking officials of the Chavez government, equivalent to the director of CIA and FBI, the the attorney general, um, and I wrote it in an article. I, I, I want to be precise in the the equivalent. Anyway, the three of them. I'll tell you what the three equivalent positions are, uh, have been d designated by the U.S. DEA as significant. Um, okay, the individuals will be director of the FBI and CIA, director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and jointly Attorney General and Secretary of Homeland Security. These have been designated as significant foreign narcotics traffickers under the drug pink, pink, uh, kingpin, sorry, the drug kingpin act, uh, kingpin act. The, the, unfortunately, this took place. This designation took place last October, just a couple of weeks before our election. Nobody paid it. Frankly, I didn't even. Uh, uh, even I, I missed it at the time. Uh, most people don't know about this. Most people don't know the connection between Chavez's aggressiveness. Once again, his his. Uh, Ties to the to the narcotics traffickers, his money, and his anti-Americanism, and what he's doing is creating this alliance that uh, does threaten our interests. He has said that what he wants to do is create this 21st century socialism in the hemisphere and eventually defeat capitalism and defeat the country that he believes is the the, the capitalist. Sorry, um, you know the the United States, uh, which he calls the empire. Uh, let, let me let me just stop there. I didn't talk too much about Honduras. It's complicated. I, I'd love to take a question about Honduras uh, and and why I believe that our government is wrong. And I've told I've told, believe me, my my former colleagues uh, why I think they're wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Otto. Um